did his PhD at uh, University of Queensland, um, then went to the uh, Australian National University for a while. Um, then uh, he was part of the green team at uh, BioWolf, and after that he moved to Berkeley, and now uh, he's still at Berkeley now. And today um, Peter is going to talk to us about um, all right. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for inviting me. So this is joint work. Um, the, the main results I'm going to tell you about are joint work with Mikhail Truskin, who's uh, going to be here over the summer. Um, but I'll also be reviewing some results with uh, Mike Jordan and, and John McAuliffe. Uh, so I'll put those out at the time. All right, so I'm talking about um, pattern classification. And in particular, large margin algorithms. Let's start by, by defining the pattern classification problem. We, we do that in a probabilistic setting. We assume that we have some joint distribution over uh, uh, this product space x by y. So the xi's are patterns in some, in some space x. Uh, and the y's are labels. And we're, we're interested in classification. Here I'll restrict our attention to the two class case. So the labels are either plus or minus 1. And the joint distribution is intended to model you know, the relative frequency of different patterns and the, and the conditional probability that a label might be one given a particular pattern. OK, so this, this assumption that there are IID is, is, is crucial in, in what we do. And the aim is to use this data, so n xy pairs, to choose some mapping from the space x to the reals that we're going to use as a classifier. We'll use the sign of that of that real valued mapping to, to uh, predict the labels for, for a particular x. And the aim is to, to come up with small risk. So our classifier here, the risk for a classifier uh, is the probability of misclassification when we threshold it at 0. right? So if the, if the real value is greater than 0, we predict a plus 1. Uh, and we suffer a penalty of 1 uh, when, we, when we get the sign wrong. So we're interested in minimizing this probability of misclassification. We define this loss function L as just getting the sign wrong here. Right? So we're interested in, in, in minimizing that expected loss. So a natural approach is to, to choose a function F from, from some class to minimize the empirical risk. That is the sample average of, of losses. Um, that's uh, typically in, computationally intractable. And it's uh, common to replace this discrete indicator of making a mistake, of getting the sign wrong, with some kind of a convex surrogate. Right? And that's the approach taken with large margin classifiers. Right? So we replace the, the uh, indicator for a mistake with some, some convex loss function and work with that. So here the idea is where we're interested in um, uh, the probability of misclassification. We're using this real valued function f. So y times f of x is a variable that we'd like to be positive. Right? If it's positive, we're making the right, the right prediction. We define some cost function of these margins, these, these variables y times f of x. Um, and it's something that you would expect to be small when, when its argument is, is uh, nice and positive and, and, and should be penalizing negative values. And then we can define, analogous to the risk, the phi risk is the expectation of this cost function evaluated at, 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 at the margin y times f of x. And we're now choosing a function from some class to minimize the phi risk, the, the, the empirical phi risk, let's say. So the, the average over the data of this cost function of the, of the margin evaluated at these data points. Or maybe we'll work with a regularized version. So let's look at a bunch of examples of that kind of thing. Adaboost is the one I'm going to concentrate on in this talk. So here, the, the class that we're, we're working with, the class of real valued functions, is the set of linear combinations of some class of basis functions. And let's say they're plus or minus one valued functions. We take, we take linear combinations of those and work with that. Um, the cost function here is the decreasing exponential. Right? So, so you know, it's quite natural for, for large positive values of the, of the margin. We, we have a, a diminished uh, cost. And Adaboost works by uh, some kind of greedy basis selection where at each step we have some linear combination of, of our, our basis functions already. And we add in a new one. Right, with some weight. And the, the choice of the new function and the weight is such, such that we minimize the empirical risk with this, with this surrogate cost, the decreasing exponential. Right, so um, Adaboost, you know, I guess, doesn't, doesn't need any more advertising. It's been very effective in a, in a bunch of applications, including 
um, uh, real-time face detection systems and spoken dialogue systems and many other success stories. Um, but Adaboost, of course, is not the only algorithm that fits in this category. Support vector machines can be viewed in this way, where the, the margin cost function is, is uh, decreasing linearly until one and then, and then zero, so it's this hinge loss. The class of functions is some ball in, the, in, a, in a certain reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and the algorithm works to minimize the empirical phi risk with, with this phi, together with some uh, complexity regularization that's a penalty for having large norm in the RKHS. Neural net classifiers, similar story with a quadratic loss or truncated quadratic loss, all sorts of other examples. Logistic regression can also be viewed in, in this kind of a way. So the first part is reviewing these, these ideas that, that, that look at the relationship between this risk, right, the misclassification probability, which is the quantity we care about, and the phi risk, the quantity that these algorithms are actually minimizing. Um, and this is joint work with Mike Jordan and, and John McAuliffe. So um, we'll see that there is a nice, a nice tight relationship between, between these two quantities. Uh, and we can come up with simple conditions on the, on the convex function phi that ensure that we get uh, a, a useful relationship between those two. In the second part of the talk, we'll be looking at applying these results as a, as a tool in understanding what's the asymptotic behavior of Adaboost. Right? Does it lead to um, uh, optimal decisions as we see more and more data? Okay, so let's start um, with a bit, of, a bit of notation. So, so we're interested in this probability of making a mistake when we threshold our, our function. We'll call that, that the risk, R of F. There's an optimal value for that. That's the Bayes risk. It's the infimum over all measurable functions, right, of, of um, this probability of making a mistake. So this is the best we can, we can hope for. What we're doing is driving the, the, the phi risk down. We're minimizing some sample average or you know, regularized or something. We're, we're doing something to, to make this, uh, this surrogate cost function small in expectation. We'll call that R phi, right, the phi risk. And, and there's an analogous optimal thing here that is the infimum over all measurable functions of the phi risk. Okay, so whatever our algorithm is doing to drive this down over some class of functions, we can't hope to have it get any smaller than that, right? That's what the algorithm is working towards, its phi risk close to this thing. What we'd like is to have its risk get close to the optimal, so we're making optimal decisions. Okay, so we can understand that the, the, um, the behavior of a classifier depends on the conditional probability that, that y equals one given a particular x, right? We can define an optimal classifier in terms of this conditional probability. I'll use the notation eta of x for that conditional probability. And that defines an optimal classifier. When we threshold this thing at a half, if the conditional probability is greater than a half, we should predict plus one. If it's less than a half, we should predict minus one. And the risk, the, and, and the Bayes risk up here is, is the risk of, of such a classifier. Okay, so um, one thing to notice, this is, this is kind of trivial, right? The phi risk can be written as the expectation of the conditional expectation of this, of this variable when we look at uh, a particular value of x, right? So if we condition on an x, then this thing takes values plus or minus one. What is that expected? What, what's the conditional expectation of that thing? You know, this is another way of writing the phi risk. Um, uh, and, and then you can view that as, you know, this is the probability that y equals one, and we get this, this component phi of f of x. This is the conditional probability that y is minus one, and we get this component to our, our phi risk. So um, now we can use that to understand what, um, uh, what minimizing the phi risk is, is doing for us. So we're splitting things up, looking pointwise at a single x, right, and worrying about the conditional expectation of this, of this variable phi of y times f of x. Okay, so uh, one, maybe two more pieces of notation before we get to some, some substance. So the... Um, uh, if we fix a particular x or, or fix a particular conditional probability that y equals one, and then look at the smallest value that the conditional phi risk that can take, right? So this is, this is choosing our f of x in here, right, to optimize this conditional expectation, right? Let's call that h of, of eta. That's the best we can do when the conditional prob at, at a particular x when the conditional probability that y equals one is equal to, to this value eta. Okay, so... Um, if we do this pointwise optimization everywhere, then we get the optimal phi risk, right? That's just minimizing for every x 
the, the conditional expectation of the fire risk, take the expectation of that, and you know, modulo some question marks about measurability here, which are, uh, are easy, to, easy to answer. Um, this, is the, this is the optimal fire risk. OK, so, so we're going to be using this, this uh, uh, quantity, the optimal conditional fire risk. So let's look at an example here. The um, black line is, is the function phi. Let's think about, um, think about the case of a truncated quadratic. Right? So it's zero here and then quadratic up there. Uh, the blue line is, is it turned around with the argument negated. And then when we can look at uh, the conditional expectation of this thing for a particular value of uh, the conditional probability, like um, 0.7, right? is that variable leader, and that's the curve as we look at different values of the, uh, of the margin. Okay, so when we go and um, minimize the, uh, the conditional expectation of that, of that uh, quantity phi, looking across different values of the conditional probability, all right, this is the optimal value. This, this line here is the optimal value for the argument, the one that minimizes it. Right at 0.7, it's, it's out here at 0.25 or something. Right, so that's up here. Um, and the, the blue one is this, is this H curve. That's the optimal conditional phi risk that we can achieve for different values of the conditional probability. All right, so, so, um, so a couple more pieces of notation. So we've seen H. What happens when we do the optimization, but, but we're forced to get the sign wrong? Right, so we're minimizing now not over all values of f of x, but minimizing over values that uh, have the sign wrong, right? Because the conditional probability here, uh, if it's greater than a half, we should be predicting in a positive way, and we're forced to predict in a negative way, right? That's the, so it's just a constrained version of this where we get the sign wrong. This defines some other function. Um, you know, this is maybe a complication, but you can observe that if, if the, uh, we, we, we can simplify this thing in the case where phi is convex, the optimal thing to choose with the wrong sign is always zero, right? So, you know, this thing is just phi of zero in the case of convex, convex cost functions. All right, um, and of course we're, we're increasing our, our um, uh, conditional phi risk when we're forced to make the wrong sign. Okay, so we say that, that the cost function phi is, is classification calibrated if whenever we don't, our conditional probability is different from a half, uh, getting the sign wrong forces, it, forces us to have a bigger value of the conditional phi risk. Right? So the optimum with the sign wrong is strictly worse than the optimum. Okay? So this is just a pointwise condition. It's obviously necessary for, for a function phi to satisfy this condition in order to get optimal behavior uh, asymptotically. Right? If pointwise you can't, you can't do well, you're in trouble when you look across the whole space. Right? Just think about a domain that has a single point, um, and, and for some value of the conditional probability, you can do just as well by getting the sign wrong uh, as you can when you're allowed complete freedom. Right? So you're, you're in trouble if you don't have this condition satisfied. It's obviously necessary. We'll see, in fact, that it's also sufficient for, for, um, uh, for a cost function phi to be suitable for, for classification. OK, last, last definition um, is, is this transform. And I've restricted it to the case of convex phi. So this thing, which would have been h minus, is just phi at 0. So this is, this is some kind of transformed version, uh, some kind of a, a function that maps here from, um, from a, a 0, 1 value, a variable that takes, takes values in the range 0 to 1. right? And it looks at the difference between the best conditional phi risk when we have the sign wrong, and the best conditional phi risk for a transformed value of the argument. OK, so, and that's the red line up here, right? We're just taking this guy and subtracting the value of h, subtracting it from the value of h at a half. All right, so that's, it's this quadratic thing in this, in this simple example we looked at before. All right, so the theorem is that um, uh, for any probability distribution, and any function, this uh, function psi of the excess risk is an upper bound on the excess phi risk. Okay, so let's think about that for a moment. 
this is the thing that we want to make small, right? We'd like to choose a function that has risk close to the optimal risk, the best, the best that we can hope for for that probability distribution. What we're doing is making this thing small, right? We're, we're choosing a function that has small expect, small, a small value of the expectation of this convex cost phi. So we're driving that thing close to its optimal value. You know, that's the best we can hope for. Do, when does that give an upper bound on this, on this excess risk? So um, uh, it gives an upper bound in terms of this, in terms of this uh, function psi. Okay, so, so we get some kind of an upper bound. It turns out that you can't do any better in the sense that this thing is, um, is pointwise the best you can hope for. Right, so for every value of the argument, there is a, a distribution and a function, and, and you know, we don't have to look at more than two points in the domain to exhibit this, uh, where the excess phi risk is as close as you like to this function psi of the excess risk. Okay, so this is a, a, a tight relationship in, in general between the excess phi risk, the thing that these algorithms are minimizing, and the excess risk, right, the thing that we care about. Um, and the, the third point is a question about, is answering the question of when this kind of a bound is, is worthwhile, right? Because, um, so this is certainly always, always convex. The, the question is when does driving this side to zero ensure that the argument is zero? Well, that happens precisely when this cost function phi satisfies this classification calibrated condition, right? So precisely when we have this, this condition involving the, the H, H minus and H, right? This obviously necessary condition is also sufficient to have minimal phi risk implying minimal risk, okay? So this is true, in fact, I, I only stated the definition of this thing for, for convex functions. You can, uh, there's a slight uh, uh, wrinkle on that to, to come up with a definition for non-convex fu functions and everything else um, follows through. In the case of, um, uh, we can skip that in the, ca okay, so we can skip over the, the proof. So the proof is, it, once you have the definitions, the proof is, is Jensen's inequality. There's really, uh, at least of the first part of the theorem is Jensen's inequality. It's really very simple. Um, um, in the case of convex cost functions, it turns out that this classification calibration condition is very easy to, to verify. All that matters is that the cost function is differentiable at zero and it decreases at zero. Right, so all of these things that we saw, all of these cost functions that we saw trivially satisfy that, that condition, right? They're differentiable at zero and they're decreasing there. Um, so the convex case, it's, it's particularly easy to, easy to check. One other thing that I, I pointed out earlier here about these functions is that they all form uh, appropriately scaled, I guess. They all form upper bounds on the, the indicator of making a mistake and that's no accident. Uh, it turns out that that's, that's necessary, right? So if you have a classification calibrated function, then you can scale it to get uh, uh, an upper bound on the, on the indicator for making a mistake. So they all have this, this property. Okay, so that's, that's a, a key tool in, in the main part of the talk, which is looking at the behavior of Adaboost as the amount of data increases. All right, so now that we, we've seen there's this, this nice relationship between the excess risk, which we'd like to drive to zero, and the excess phi risk, which our algorithms are working with, um, we'll use that as a tool in understanding how this particular algorithm, which uses uh, uh, phi as the decreasing exponential, how it behaves asymptotically in the, in the sample size, in the amount of data. All right, so let me, let me start by defining um, universal consistency, what precisely we mean there, and then we'll look at kind of the standard approaches to proving these sorts of asymptotic properties, which, which fail in the Adaboost case, right? So there's, um, there's, there's more work that, that we need to do. All right, so the universal consistency question is we have, you know, just as before, IID data, and we've got some method that is a function that takes us from, from a sample to a um, to a, a, a function, and we say it's universally consistent if no matter what probability distribution we're presented with, the risk of this sequence of functions approaches 
the, the Bayes risk um, in, in the limit as the sample size grows. All right, so we're just interested in what happens asymptotically in the sample size. And the universally is because we're worrying about all probability distributions. There's no model here, right? There's just whatever, whatever joint distribution we have, can we cope with that? Can we make optimal pr predictions as the sample gets large? Okay, so the standard approach to proving this kind of property involves an approximation estimation sort of decomposition, right? So you, you um, uh, let's suppose, for instance, that we were working with um, minimizing an empirical empirical risk across, um, uh, across some set together with a regularization term. All right, there's one kind of algorithm that we could consider. This is the regularized uh, form. Or another approach is like a method of sieves where we take a class F of functions and we split it up into simple ones and more complex ones and so on. And as the sample size grows, we allow more and more complex functions. So there are these two different ways that, that, that people look at regularizing, right? A either having a regularization term that enforces smooth functions less and less as the sample grows, or having, um, having a sequence of, of function classes that gets bigger and bigger. So we're being more and more relaxed about the complexity of our functions as the sample size grows. Okay, so for these kinds of algorithms, and, and let's consider the latter case a little simpler to, to, to demonstrate here. For these kinds of algorithms, we have a um, uh, we, we have an obvious uh, line of attack to, to try to show that our um, excess risk is going to zero. So we have this relationship between the excess risk and the excess phi risk. So we work with the, the excess phi risk and split it up into this is the phi risk of the function that we chose. Let's look at the difference between that and the best over, the, over this class of functions, um, Fn. Uh, and then look at this other term. So we're just introducing these, these two terms. Let's look at this other term, which is how, how close to uh, the optimum can we get within that class? Okay, so this is an approximation estimation decomposition, right? If we're restricted to the class Fn, that's the best we can do, right? And um, uh, you know, so obviously we'd want our class our class Fn to be nice and big in order to get this approximation error small, but the um, the cost of that is a statistical one. We have a finite sample. And as we look over richer and richer classes, it becomes harder to, to choose something based on that finite sample that gets close to the best in that big, big class, right? So there's this trade-off between the approximation and the estimation errors. And the usual argument um, for these kinds of things uh, is to say, well, if we've got a, a rich class and we let these guys get large, right, these, these subclasses get large sufficiently slowly, then we'll be okay, right? Sufficiently slowly means this term is under control, and, and if they're nice and large, then asymptotically, you know, this, this approximation error is going to go away. So, you know, this is the, the, the usual approach. And then, of course, we can use this, this uh, relationship between the excess risk and the excess phi risk to, to say, well, then we've got our, our excess risk going to zero, provided we're working with a sensible convex cost. Okay? So one thing to point out, this, the, these approximation and estimation errors is a little different from the normal analysis of, the, of, of um, uh, classifiers because we're working in terms of the phi risk. So this is more like a regression kind of a problem, right, than a, than a classification problem. Okay, so that's, that's how things work in the, um, uh, that, that's the approximation estimation decomposition. For Adaboost, things are a little complicated. And the difficulty is this statistical term, right, the estimation error. In the Adaboost case, we're working with this, a space of linear combinations of functions. All right? and, and there's nothing about the algorithm that keeps us in some small set of functions here. In particular, the range of values of the functions uh, is, is not constrained. So you know, the statistical part, that keep, keeping control of the estimation error is a, is a difficult thing. Okay, so just to remind you, the Adaboost algorithm takes this sample of size n and um, starts off with a, a linear combination that's just the zero function and adds in at each step another function from our class of basis functions scaled by some, some real number and it adds in that, that scaled classifier um, uh, that optimizes this empirical phi risk, right? This, the sample average of these decreasing exponentials. Yoram. Um, 
so uh, you said something that uh, bothered me. You said that you know the scaling, in the age of X is unconstrained, right? But eight? typically to get strong to uh, weak strong vulnerability, you assume that the image of H is staying bounded, the element is the norm of all the ages. That's right. Right. The difficulty, so, so this one here, in fact, I'm working just with classifiers, right? So the H here are plus or minus one. Okay, so if, if these were convex coefficients, we'd be fine. But the point is they're not, right? They're, they're, we're working with the linear span of these functions. The alphas here can be as big as we like, right? Whatever it is that drives this down is, is whatever we take. So we can take arbitrarily big steps, right? You, you, you keep control of the size of the, of the combination that you work with. That's right. So, so that's the difficulty of working with the, the, the estimation error term for, for Adaboost. Okay, so, um, okay so, so one way of dealing with, with that issue is to work with a regularized uh, a, a version of the, of the criterion, right? To either add in an explicit regularization term that penalizes big... Um, big functions in some sense, or to make sure that the steps we take are small, you know, these alphas are small, right, or, or something. So, so there, are, there are a bunch of analyses of regularized versions of, of Adaboost um, uh, of this kind. I mean, I guess one thing that you have to point out, uh, that, that I should point out, is that, you know, if we're working with some sensible class of basis functions, we can drive this criterion down to zero, right? The span, if, if, if the class is rich enough that the span is dense in um, uh, in, uh, I don't know, you know, some, some big space, then, then we can drive this criterion down to zero, and, and we don't want to do that. So we don't really want to optimize this thing over the span. We're going to have to do some regularization. Um, uh, and, and the question is, um, what, what sort of regularization do we need to do? So one approach where we explicitly impose regularization by saying, look, let's penalize big coefficients. Let's make sure that our, um, let's work with, right up here, let's work with the convex hull of functions from our basis class, um, scaled up by some number gamma sub n, and we'll let gamma grow as the sample size grows, right? So then we're working with bigger and bigger um, uh, uh, functions. Um, another approach, the, the, this is like a method of sieves, this is like a, a regularized version. Another approach is to work with the empirical phi risk plus a regularization term that penalizes the one norm of the coefficients, right, of our combination. So rather than working with, um, explicitly with, with the, um, restricting ourselves to a, a one ball in parameter space, we could penalize by the, the one norm of the parameters. Both of these cases, um, you know, the analysis is really very standard, right? And it follows the, the lines that I showed earlier, and, 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 you know, you can show that these algorithms behave nicely as the, uh, as the sample size grows. And, and you get um, misclassification probability approaching the, the, the optimum. Another approach is to, is to bound the step size. So we look at the optimum, the optimal value of the, uh, optimal real value of a step that we, we might want to take, and we constrain it to be smaller than some number epsilon. Okay? And if we choose the number of steps to be not too large as the function of the sample size, and the step size to be not too large, well then we're constraining the parameters again. Right? So this is analogous to working with a method of sieves, except that, you know, when we're not doing an, optimize, an explicit optimization over the class as, as these algorithms, whoops, yes, as these algorithms were, right? We're, we're using the Adaboost approach of just greedily stepping through the space, you know, a coordinate at a time, uh, and it turns out that, that um, again, this works well. So this is a little more involved than the, than the approach that I, I, the generic approach I described earlier, but you know, still can, uh, you, you still can show that, that when you impose these kinds of constraints, you get a good uh, asymptotic performance. Um, okay, but, but how is Adaboost used in practice? It's, it's with early stopping, right? You take a bunch of steps and, and you stop at some point, right? It's not, you're not imposing regularization, you're not, not keeping the steps, the individual steps small, you're just taking the steps that Adaboost wants to take adding in the functions until you get to a, uh, a combination that, that um, uh, uh, is appropriate, maybe through cross-validation or maybe through some fixed schedule, you know, there's a, a restricted number of steps. So let's suppose that we have a, a fixed schedule, right, kind of simplest uh, 
simplest case, how should we choose that, that schedule? Well, you know, obviously, it, we, we can't let it get arbitrarily large because, as, as I pointed out, this criterion can, can go to zero. So there is a result of this form um, uh, with a bunch of conditions. Um, so, so, so for certain basis classes and, and probability distributions that satisfy some, some strong smoothness assumptions, then there, there is some sequence of, of uh, number of steps or size of combinations so that the, the risk approaches the, the Bayes risk. So this is a result due to Zhang. Um, the difficulty here is that they're, they're really very strong conditions on the probability distribution. You, 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 um, the, the argument involves doing Taylor series expansions of, of log odds and, and you know, it's, it's really keeping uh, everything close to conditional probabilities. You need, you need the distribution on X to be um, uh, continuous. Uh, there, are, there are all sorts of conditions here that, that um, we can't check. Um, the other thing that's not very satisfying is that there's no indication how the stopping time should grow with the sample size, uh, and in particular whether it needs to grow with the, uh, whether it needs to depend on the particular probability distribution that we have. So it turns out that, that um, uh, we, we can get uh, rates on how this sample size needs to grow, uh, on, on how the number of steps needs to grow with the sample size, uh, and that's the the key result that I want to tell you about now. All right, so first of all, there are a couple of assumptions that we need. Um, they're, they're really mild in the sense that, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine getting by without them, right? So, so we need that the basis functions that we work with have finite uh, vapnik chervin yankis dimension. So, you know, there's this combinatorial constraint that we can't have an arbitrarily rich class of basis functions. And if we don't have that, then uh, you can construct distribution so that AdaBoost will stop after one step and fail, right? It'll match the data after one step and, and have a bad classifier. So, so, you know, there's nothing you can do to avoid this if you want to work with all, uh, if you want a universal result that works with all distributions. Um, the other requirement is that, that the approximation error in the, in the sense of this phi risk should be zero asymptotically, right? So when we work with the span of, when we work with all linear combinations, we can drive our phi risk down to the optimal value. Okay, so it's essential that, you know, again, this is, this is um, uh, not unreasonable that we need to have this approximation error go to zero. And there are, you know, plenty of basis function classes, simple basis function classes that ensure this, right, for, for all probability distributions. So, you know, again, it's not a, it's not a, a strong constraint. And then the result says, under these conditions, as, the, as long as the stopping time as a function of sample size goes to infinity and goes to infinity not too fast, so it's anything slower than linear in the sample size, then we get our risk approaching the Bayes risk. Right? We get this universal consistency result. So as the sample size grows, we're, we're making optimal, uh, asymptotically making optimal predictions with, with AdaBoost. Um, and, and we get an explicit um, uh, rate for the number of, of, of steps that we're allowed to take. It's sublinear in the, in the sample size. Okay, so I want to tell you very quickly about the, the um, uh, idea of the, of the proof and, and in particular how we get around this, this business that, that Adaboost can take very large steps. So we work with one, one, of the, one of the key ideas is to work with a clipped version of the uh, of the functions, right? So we, if this is our, the function that we have after, after we've formed a combination of T of these basis functions, we're going to consider not that function and its phi risk, but a clipped version, right? We, we clip it at some value, and we're going to relax the clipping as the sample size grows. Um, if, the, if the phi risk of the clipped version goes to the optimal value, this implies that the risk is going to go to the optimal value, right? And it's clipped. It, uh, and we were going to threshold at zero anyway, so the clipping has no influence over here, right? So, so you know, this is what we're shooting for. All right, now, now we're, we're looking at these functions as combinations of not too many functions from a basis class, and they're clipped. You know, this is a very straightforward relationship between 
the empirical phi risk, uh, a classical relationship between the empirical values of, of, of these things and the expected values, right? These are nice and close as a, um, a function of the size of our combinations. And then once we're in this domain of the, of the empirical phi risk, right, the clipping is only helping on this side. Right? This, is our, this is our exponential cost function that Adaboost is working with. When we clip over here, that helps us. It drives that thing down. When we clip over here, it hurts us, but it hurts us in an exponentially small way as this parameter gets, gets big. So you know, it's no big deal when we're in this domain of the empirical phi risk. And in that domain, that's exactly where Adaboost is working. Right? This is the thing that Adaboost is making small. So here we can apply some, some ideas from, from a, a result of, of uh, Peter Bickel and, and uh, Yaki Ritov that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we can, we can show, using these ideas, we can show that the empirical phi risk uh, after t steps gets close to the best, uh, gets close to the best empirical phi risk of some function in a, uh, a small L1 ball. Okay, so you know it depends on the L1 radius of this function we're comparing ourselves to in the number of steps, but you know this is we're, we're comparing ourselves to some some uh, scaled convex combination of, of functions, and this is relying on um, uh, particular properties of the exponential cost function and the fact that our classifiers are binary valued. All right, this is what keeps the the steps that Adaboost takes from being too large. Okay, so that's a crucial part of the. Uh, of the of the analysis, I have a little more to say about that later. And then finally, you know, we're working with this comparison. This function has empirical phi risk that's close to the to its true phi risk. You know, this is just we're talking about one function and saying its its uh, expectation and sample average are, uh, are not so far apart. This is not a um, not so hard to believe, right? And so then, you know, as long as we let the number of steps grow only slowly with the sample size. We get the empirical, the, the phi risk approaching the optimum, and we have the result. So in, in pictures, all right, this is the domain where we're talking about there should be phi risk over here, and this is empirical phi risk. We, we, thresh, we, we clip our functions that we get after t steps. We look at how the true risk compares to the, the empirical. We look at how the, um, the, the, the clipping has little impact on us. And then there's this numerical result that says when we take, when Adaboost takes these steps, because of the, of the nice properties of the exponential function, uh, taking t many steps puts us close to some, some guy that has a small L1 radius and is the optimal within that L1 ball. And that guy's empirical risk is close to his true risk. And you know, over here, as this L1 ball gets big, we're getting close to the optimal thing. So you know, it's quite a roundabout uh, kind of an argument. Um, and, and, and the crucial step has to be, has to be taken. The, the crucial step in the argument is this performance of the Adaboost algorithm as a numerical procedure for minimizing this empirical phi risk, and it's how that, how that behaves as a function of the number of steps and the radius of the L1 ball in which our comparison function lies. All right, so that's, that's the, the key idea there. So, there are some natural, natural um, extensions that you would, you would think of here. There are these other algorithms that work with slightly different loss functions, right, that, um, you know, it's been argued have, have nice properties also. Uh, does, does this argument uh, tell us anything about their behavior uh, asymptotically? And in, in fact, it doesn't. The difficulty is that we don't have, um, we don't have this, this information about the second derivative of the empirical phi risk. Um, in the direction of a basis function, and and that's what, and that's what we need. We need a nice lower bound on this on this second derivative. So you know this is problematic for these other functions. Exponential seems to be seems to be nice. The same problem arises when we consider real valued basis functions. You know this is kind of surprising, right? I, uh, when you when you look at plus minus one valued basis functions, we're combining classifiers, everything's fine, and we know that when we move in the direction of a basis function, we have this nice lower bound on the second derivative. This is not the case when you allow real-valued basis functions. So you know the uh, things don't go through here, which is 
is kind of striking, I think. Um, you know, it could be just a, uh, an artifact of the technique, of course. Um, and one other direction, the, the rates that we get when we look at, the, um, look at everything all together, what's the convergence rate that we get, the rate of decrease of the phi risk to the, the optimal, uh, and, and hence of the risk to the optimal, <coughs> maybe under some uh, approximation assumption. And the bottleneck here is the numerical result. Right? Although we know, you know from the behavior of this exponential function, we know that we're, we're um, approaching the best in some L1 ball, uh, the, the numerical result just tells us that we get close to it at this terrible rate. Right? It's 1 over the square root of the log of the number of steps that we take. So this is atrocious. Right? It, seems, it seems incredibly pessimistic. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of bottleneck there if we wanted to get explicit rates on the, on the rate of convergence to the, to the optimum. <coughs> Okay, so the two key points are that we, we can, you know, the, uh, one of the main ingredients here is we can relate the, the excess risk to the, um, the excess phi risk, right, which is what our, our algorithms are minimizing. And, and this is, you know, one of the key tools in, in showing that as the sample size grows, add a boost um, with a, a number of steps that's allowed to grow sublinearly in the sample size uh, has risk that approaches the, the optimum. Uh, asymptotically. All right. Yeah, so, so the question is, when, when we consider the relationship between the excess risk and the excess phi risk, there's this function psi or psi inverse that appears there, and this seems to affect the rates. If you have a certain rate of convergence of the, of the phi risk to its optimal value, then that gets transformed through this psi function to give you a, a, a potentially worse, actually, it's always a convex function, so it's always no better, uh, rate of convergence of the risk to the optimal risk. Um, so yeah, that's a good point, and it, it turns out that the, the best relationship is a linear one, and the best relationship is obtained when the, um, uh, when the cost function is, um, is least convex, right? So the hinge loss, for instance, has a linear relationship between the two. The quadratic has a square root relationship, right? So you get, your rate gets worse in that case. So is that real? Does it, does it mean that you, know, you should be using a hinge loss and not a quadratic? So that's not, that's not clear. If you consider, for instance, um, cases where we can work out explicit rates and um, uh, look at what's going on there, um, uh, one example there is when you have um, explicit information, like Sibakov kind of conditions, on the conditional probability. Right? So it turns out the easy case in classification is when the conditional probability that y equals 1 given x is moves through a half um, rather quickly, right? If it spends a lot of time near a half, then it's harder to make the decisions and the rates are worse. If it moves through a half quickly, then, then it's easier, the rates are better. So there, um, it turns out that this better relationship in the SVM case, or the hinge loss case, doesn't help you, right? That, that, um, that you get, at the end of it all, you get exactly the same rate as, as having, having a worse relationship, right? So. You know, it's really unclear what's the, and these are cases where we can get an explicit handle on, on, on the rates. So it's unclear that that that, that is any basis for, for uh, differentiating between one cost function and another, right? Um, I mean, there are, other, there are other issues at play, of course, right? When you put things through this cost function, then you're interested in approaching the, this R phi star, the optimal phi risk. What's that going to look like as you change phi? Right, for a particular class of functions, you know, the approximation properties are going to be very different. Right, so this is another issue that you know, really is just hidden away in all of these analyses because you know, that's like an approximation rate. It's something uh, that's very hard to, to get a handle on in any, in any concrete situation. Right? But, but yeah, good, it's a good question. What, what, uh, what differentiates these, these cost functions? 
Thank you.